Today is going to be different. This is something that has been heavy on my heart and it was precipitated by a few events that happened on YouTube. Okay, the title of this segment as you saw is Be careful what you think that you believe in. Be very careful what you digest. And I'm not talking about politi politics or anything like that. I'm talking about you. Be careful what you digest. I'm going to give you a few examples. As you know, many of you have come across me because of the storage auctions, you know, the YouTube channel and so on and so forth. Well, the first day I was on the auction trail, I met this really nice guy. His name was Dan. Very nice guy. You know, the type of guy that holds doors open for all ladies. Really, really nice. You know, if he was eating a sandwich, he'd just offer you half. That type of person. He had been out there on the storage auction trail about 20 years. And we're just talking, and I told him about some of my ambitions because I went out there and I said, well, it's my intention to make this a full-time endeavor. And he's like, oh, oh, no, no. Don't do that to yourself, friend. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, look, keep it part-time. This business is just going to break your heart. I've been trying to do it full-time for 20 years. I've been out here. Everyone knows me. I've had a few good ones, but just could not really you know, let my main gig go. And he was a plumber. So he did contract plumbing work. He would come to auctions. Well, about... A year into it, I was talking to Dan, and he said, you're really good for a newcomer. And I said, well, I'll try. And a year after that, I had the store and warehouse. He's like, and he was like, so you, you came out here with a lot of money. I said, no, actually, this all started with $1,350 from a garage sale. And he just looked at me. He's like, you're lying. And he got upset with me. He's like, he got real upset and he's like, I was your friend when you came out here. I didn't bid against you and you're going to lie to me? I was like, Dan, I'm not lying to you. Let me tell you what Dan's problem was. You've heard the example of the student that fell asleep in the classroom and he woke up and supposedly solved the unsolvable math problem because no one told him he couldn't solve it. When you tell yourself over and over and over and over you can't do something guess what you're not going to do it Dan had been telling himself for 20 years he could not be a full time storage auction buyer when I met Dan he had 20 years of experience on me the day he got pissed off in like 6 months after the day I never saw him again he had 22 years of experience to my two. What was the difference? Number one, I had goals before I even went out there. I didn't know what storage auctions were about. I heard about them, but I didn't really know. But my goal was, and I wrote it down, bam, bam, bam. I want to, because the, the contract office furniture business was starting to suck wind. We were entering a period of contracting office space. The average office is much smaller now, you know, 10 years, actually 12 years now, than it was back then. And it's going to get smaller. I just saw the trend and I was like, well, I could stay here and continue to fight with big boys. Or, or if I really wanted to do well, I was going to have to travel all over the country and manage projects all over the country. I didn't want to do that. I hate business travel. Travel for pleasure is fun. But business travel, living in hotels, when I was younger, it was cool. But now, hell no. Well, I got out, wrote down the goals. And went out with an expectation of being successful. This is something I learned from one of my sales managers. He said, before every presentation in your mind, say you're going to nail it. Now, we live in America where you're supposed to be humble. You're supposed to be very thankful and happy when shit goes right. You're not supposed to say, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to nail this presentation. I'm going to knock their socks off. You're not supposed to say that because that's not humble. My sales manager, and I really thank him, he was pretty much balls to the wall type guy. And he's like, you know, sometimes he would punch me in the chest. He's like, you're going to nail it, right? I mean, hard. <laughs> I was like, what is wrong with this fool? 
But I got the message. You must be convinced before you can convince the client. Because I have gone into sales presentations in the beginning. I wasn't smooth. I wasn't slick. I had a lot of energy and enthusiasm and passion. That got me over. That got me deals. And I started to learn because you need something to work with. You just can't get good thinking you're going to get good without actually going out there and doing some things. Well, I, I learned to expect good things. Does this mean it's always going to happen? No, I'm not going to lie to you. It's not. There's going to be times you, you, you expect it to do well and you seriously crashed and burned. And that's okay. Because when you expect things to go well, most of the time, they do. Back to the storage auction business. I found out that Dan started bad, you know, bad mouthing me, and it was like I was arrogant, and I was high and mighty, and he taught me everything I knew. Then the people that heard this came to me, and it's like, well, if he taught you, why can't he do what you're doing? And I said, hey, there's your answer right there. What happened was I created this paradox that made Dan's belief system start to crash. And when the facade of his belief system crashed, and he had to accept the reality that he did not do the right things. It was a bitter pill to swallow. It was a very bitter pill to swallow. Because for 20 years, he had been telling himself over and over and over and over, I can't be a full-time storage auction buyer. And he made it come true. Then I came out there and did what he wanted to do for 20 years in two. He was not happy with me because I held up a mirror to his face that said, your belief system, and your, your expectations, your flaws, it, it has, it's flawed. Your belief system is flawed. It has cracks. There's something wrong with it. So, we went through that. Now, today on YouTube, I put up a video, 25 Ways to Make Money Without Having a Job. And I decided to do this because I have not had a job since late 2001. I just haven't. And then people start coming out. And this, this is a, a teaching moment because you can go back and check out the comments. Because I put up, I have a few friends who trade currency. Now, let's, you know, before, you know, before we even get into that, we're going to get into that much, much later. But it's hard to be successful. Just clarify that. It's hard, but it's not impossible. It's hard, but it's not impossible. It's difficult, it's tricky, but it's not impossible. Keep that. It's not impossible. And we're going back and forth, and I just laid out that, you know, a 20-year vet told me I could be a full-time storage auction buyer. And I'm going to tell you another narrative, because what this is about is the narratives that you digest. The things that you take in here, because when they come in here, like a cancer, they grow and they actually crowd out the possibilities. When I started writing, uh, I have, you know, give you some background on that. I've, I've wanted to write for so long. I mean, talking about the 90s, but, you know, time was never right for me. You know, family obligations, I always had to do things, and I could just never sit down and just chase my dream. Well, I fell into the storage auction business, and it was like an adventure. It kind of satisfied that hunger of writing because there were so many narratives out there in each and every unit. Well... After I got sick and I was healing up, I started writing again and it just started coming out. During that period of time, I started networking with other writers. Whew. The world of writing is full of people who don't believe in themselves. They don't. I see it every day. I see it in forums. And there are people who are conditioning their minds for failure. This is why you have to be very, very careful what you believe in. Carmen, a friend of mine, 22 years as a writer, very successful, traditionally published, about 30 books. She's a serious deal. This is what she told me after seeing my first manuscript. You need to take five or six years, work on your craft, and then put your work out there. That's what she told me. She said, I see a little talent, but you really need to work on so many things. You know, and she's like, I'm not trying to be hateful, just my opinion. Now, she's a romance writer. I was writing a business book. She's a romance writer. P. 
People who write in different genres, unless they're exceptionally objective, tend to hate things that are not in their genre. I don't read romance books because I know I inherently I'm not going to like them. I don't, you know, I read sci business, nonfiction, sci-fi, fantasy, you know, good stuff to me. And she told me that. And I immediately went home, and I know it's going to sound very serious, silly to you, and I sat down at my computer, and it's like, I am going to make a full-time living as a writer. I'm going to do it. I'm going to write well. I'm going to write stuff that's going to impact people. I'm going to write things that are going to be good to great. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to be a full-time writer. I did it in 14 months. After hearing that from a 20-something-year vet, because... Years ago, I was listening to this tape by Brian Tracy, and he was talking about how you must be solid in your beliefs. Once again, this has nothing to do with religion. This is about what you believe in about yourself and in your world. Well, he was talking about a sailor who had been on the ship for many years, and this passenger that was on the ship who was getting seasick was telling the sailor, like, you should be careful or you're going to get seasick. And the sailor just like, no, I'm not. I'm used to this. And walked off. That's the kind of attitude you must inherently inherit, inherently hold for yourself, regardless of what people tell you. I mean, seriously, there's many times I was told, just to be blunt, I wasn't going to be shit. Came from a single parent household. One of those kids. Now, let me tell you about the single parent household. My mother was a single mother. There was three of us. Not one of us had a child out of wedlock. My sister doesn't have any kids. She's not married. My brother has one. He's married. I didn't have any kids until I got married. Yeah, got married, then had kids. I know. Wow, right? I say that, people get mad. Brother and sister went to school and finished. I didn't. I was a college dropout. But all went on to be productive, solid citizens from a single parent household. That's more common than you think. But none of us believe that we're going to grow up because people tell me it's like you're not going to be shit because of your circumstances. You cannot believe that. You got to just go, ah, throw it up. You cannot digest that because it's a, it's a dangerous thing. People want labels and to define you because it makes them very comfortable dealing with you. That is probably the reason I'm not on television. Just straight up. I had five opportunities and I just refuse to play ball straight up I just refuse to play ball I'm not gonna lie to these people I'm not about staging units I'm not gonna do it I think based on my beliefs what I actually saw with these two eyes and held with these two hands that I pulled out of units that that was good enough to make great television because it entertained my ass for eight years that was the biggest driver because you don't get a unit, you don't know what's in there. It's, it could be crap, it could be good, it could be a lovely. There's so many things it could be. That drove me. I mean, it was just freaking exhilarating because I refused to believe in other people's narratives. I used to think being a special ed kid was a problem. When you go through six years of speech pathology like I did, you have to develop a lot of intestinal fortitude. Number one, people are teasing you. Number two, kids are mean. There's bullying. There's all this stuff that's going on. Yet there's this other group, and I had two speech pathologists that were great to me. I'm sad I can't remember their names. But they was like, every day for six years, you can do it. Every day. I had the hardest problem saying words that ended in TH. In other words, I would screw up. And to this day, I still screw up. I just keep talking and just, just go right past that. It taught me to believe in myself. That's what you have to do. Whatever WAS, which is a wild ass scheme that you have in your mind, until you try it, until you put your heart, your foot, your soul in it, you don't know where it's gonna go. And one of the biggest impediments to your success isn't you. It's the people that surround you and the things that they say to you consistently. Once again, in 2009, I told a friend I was going to start a YouTube channel and I was going to make partner. Man, why you want to do YouTube? That, that shit's for kids. I was like, no, it's a great view. It's a great medium. It's powerful. I'm going to do it because I don't have the skills to do the blog thing the way that other people are doing and 
not that many people who do what I'm doing are doing you know YouTube videos. There's like very few. So the field is wide open. No, no, no. Many people, uh, there was about six people that was thought it was silly, said so. And it's like, why are they going to do YouTube? That's for kids. I mean, seriously. But did I listen? Hey, 500 and something videos later, I guess not. The thing is, if you know that you're on a good path, you have to have confidence in yourself to move forward. Now, what we're going to do on... The webinar is talking about this and then there's going to be activities but I'm going to touch on the activities a little bit here first thing you have to do is mentally and sometimes verbally say that's not true when someone gives you something that is detrimental to your mental state which is highly important to your success you have to actually say that's not true for me that may be true for them but that's not true for me I refuse it I'm not going to adopt it I'm not going to accept it I'm going to do me you have to make that decision mentally. Then in the space of negative self-talk, you have to start saying, I'm going to do it. I used to meditate, and that's something else we're going to get into because I go through periods where I do it, but it's like I kind of meditate through my exercise now. Because one of my biggest problems was lack of focus. So my meditation word was focus. I would sit there and say focus in my mind for 20s to sometimes 30 minutes in a meditative state. I noticed changes happening the first week because, you know, in terms of tech, I was using focus consistently, like focus, focus, focus. I was overriding all the bullshit that was going in my mind. It took a few months, and the first time I meditated, I passed out. I mean, seriously, I passed out because I was so stressed. There was so much tension and stuff in my body. I literally passed out because the meditative state released all of that stress and my body just went oh i was out i don't know if you've ever had the first time you've ever had like a really good massage a real therapeutic massage it'll put your ass to sleep that's what the med the first time i meditated did for me i was just completely knocked out i woke up groggy like i was drugged that's how much stuff that goes on and when i talk about meditation once again there's no religious connotation to it at all meditation is like exercise for the mind Exercise strengthens your mind, strengthens your attention, and it also improves your health. So, no religious connotations. We're not talking about that. Well, I went through that stuff. And so, part of keeping your mental playground clean is being vigilant about what enters your mind. That's one of the reasons I don't watch television a lot. I love football. I watch football. I watch movies, Law and Order. And if you look at television too long, you start to accept certain narratives that are not true and harmful. Let me give you one narrative that's very prevalent right now. Men are idiots. You see it in commercials. You see it in sitcoms. You see it in movies. Whereas women are brave, strong, and make the right decision. There are some women who are brave. There are some women who are strong. There are some women who frequently make the right decision. But if you're dating histories like mine... You don't run into that chick all the time. Maybe 30% of the time, maybe 40% of the time, which means there's just as many jacked up women out there as there are men. But the narrative is they're better than men. And you see that. You see it in commercials. You see, you see it over and over and over. And if you notice something, and mostly there are men here, I call it the wussification of America. It's not cool to be a man. It's not cool to be masculine because that narrative is being force fed down our throats and it's being force fed in the most convenient insidious manner possible television popular music and literature something else has happened i don't know if you paid attention to it but remember when we were growing up and you used to use he in place of you know where it was she it was he now it's she don't know when that happened but i started reading i've noticed it happened about three four years i just start seeing it more i was like i still use he but I haven't bought in to that paradigm and for a certain reason because I don't think I have to but that's the things you have to do another thing that you have to do is you know this is we're gonna have a whole class on this called scripting your day I mentally script it but I used to have to write it down you write down how you want your day to go I know it sounds simple right silly 
you'll be amazed at how frequently your day will go as you script it because you're programming this thing. This right here is the beginning and end of your success. Not your talent level. Nope, not your talent level. If you get this straight and you get your work ethic really high, you can do so much. You can do more in a few years than, the pe than some people do in a lifetime because they're unfocused, undirected, and they're just everywhere and they believe in the narratives that no longer serve them. Another one, getting a college education ensures sure paths of success. No, it's not. Getting the right education at the right time in the right field with experience is the path to success. You add all that stuff up from the right school. <laughs> Okay, then it's a different, this is like, okay, yeah, you know, if you want to be an attorney at High Fluten Putin Tutin Law Firm in New York, you need to go to Harvard, Princeton, or one of the other schools they like, graduate in the top 10% of the class, and then you've got a shot at getting in there. If you don't do those things, you're not getting in, unless you're just exceptionally brilliant. That's the reality. So, in terms of these narratives you have to be really careful and as Earl Nightingale said in Lead the Field you can you have a choice in this you can script your own narrative now let's get back to my writer friend who told me that I should take five or six years now being a part of the storage auction business was probably one of the best things to happen to me in my life I learned so much and it strengthened me as a person in ways that I'm still discovering. I knew that if I worked hard, I would be okay as a writer. I wasn't, my goal, my first goal in the first book, and I'll be honest with you, it was jacked up. It had a lot of mistakes. It had a lot of errors. But my number one goal was to start and finish the book. Goal number one. Why? I have a lot of friends who are writers. Many of those people have one, two, three, four books. One of the hardest things for many writers is to finish the book. I figure, even if it was crappy, if I finished it and developed that discipline to finish, then I can improve on everything else. See, everything for me is a process. What many people look upon as failure, because you in, in writing world, to write your first book is crappy, it's full of errors. Oh God, you'll never get another chance. I don't believe in that. I believe that you will get a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, a sixth chance. I believe you'll get chances into perpetuality. See, I replace that. Oh, you'll never get another chance. That's their paradigm. That's their thought process. That's why they are where they are. I have a friend who's a brilliant writer. Been working on a book for four years. It's not done. Not halfway done. Because she doesn't have the mental fortitude and the discipline to sit her ass in the chair and get it done. My friends, having the work ethic and the ability to start and finish projects will take you further in life than all the brilliance and talent in the world of a lazy person. It will. It will. I've seen it. One of the reasons that I was able to move up the storage auction ranks was I outworked those fuckers. Straight up. I just outworked them. I learned, I analyzed, and I did not believe in false narratives. But to the writer friend, she filed bankruptcy this year. I'm not going to dance on her misery. The person who told me three years ago that I needed to work on my craft and not put my work out recently filed bankruptcy. Yet I make a full-time and generous living as a full-time writer. Let's marinate on that. This isn't about me. Trust me, this isn't about me. Because I refuse to believe her narrative. I refuse to adopt it. I refuse to eat it. I refuse to digest it. I refuse to let it get in my body and grow. She's more talented than I am. I have no problem saying that. She's way more talented than I am. But I'm clever. I work hard. I know how to analyze. And I know what works in business and what doesn't. She doesn't know any of that. I just gave you a very important lesson. If you know what works in business 
you'll do better than someone who's naturally gifted. Because many people who are naturally gifted are lazy or they lean too much on their gift and they never develop it. I'll give you an example. A person who is naturally gifted but doesn't work as hard as they could. Randy Moss. If Randy Moss was not such a head case and he worked his ass off, he would have exceeded Jerry Rice because he had more natural talent. He's still in the NFL because of his talent, but he isn't producing because his mind isn't right. Give you an example of tremendous talent and a voracious work ethic. Michael Jordan. Michael was talented, but his work ethic was larger than his talent level. I had a friend I used to work with around the corner. It's so funny. I used to actually work at a hospital that's like five minutes from my place. She had a cousin who played for the Bulls back then. And when they come in town, he'd come by and they were real close. And he would tell us stories. In practice, he's like, if you missed an assignment or you didn't do what you do, Michael was subject to punch your ass. There was no doubt about who was the leader of that team. And the thing is, he would punch your ass if you were not working as hard as he was. Understand, he wasn't like Allen Iverson, practice, practice. No, he was like, we're here to practice. We're here to win. We're going to make it happen. 